This is Jay Tucker. I run the Center for Media, Entertainment, and Sports at UCLA's Business School, and I'm so excited to be here with Matthew Hiltzik, um, who is going to be talking to us today about really handling crises um, and marketing and communications in times like this. I think this is a really timely conversation. Um, we're going to get into lots more than that. Matthew's got a storied background, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, but first, thank you, Matthew, for being here. We really appreciate you joining us. Jay, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Now, to kick it off, I wanted you to give people a little bit more of a sense of where you're coming from so we can kind of bring people into the conversation. So, as you see this, uh, this slide come up, it's sort of a perspective on how uh, our world uh, works right now. Uh, it used to be that everybody in entertainment wanted to be in politics, and everybody in politics wanted to be in entertainment. And then you added in tech on the top, you added in sports on the, uh, on the bottom. And you, if, you, if you keep it going with the animation, it should hopefully work where the other arrows come up. But you can basically see that all of these areas interface with each other. At the center of it are finance and brands and law and media and storytelling. So for example, if you, if you look at this, um, we'll give some examples of, of a couple of stories, but, um, if you're in the space of entertainment, obviously we've seen plenty of people who have gone from the world of entertainment uh, into politics, uh, many in an informal way in terms of uh, supporting candidates and, and raising money. Uh, but we've, the Republican, uh, Republicans who have tried to go from that world to the political world and holding office have uh, been a little higher profile between Ronald Reagan and, and, uh, and our current president and, um, and uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sonny Bono and a whole bunch of people. Uh, there are fewer Democrats who have, uh, who have made that jump, but the interface between the two is, has always been there going back when you know, Bill Clinton went, our, went on Arsenio Hall show and people started to see that there were ways to be able to bridge those. And, uh, and, and we see so many activists in the entertainment community caring about the political world. Uh, when you look at the tech side of things, the, it used to be that tech cared about, uh, tech folks cared about politics and issue advocacy because uh, of issues about immigration reform, uh, to primarily to be able to ensure that a lot of the students who came to this country would be able to have the opportunity uh, to stay and work with them. So it was, a, it was a talent issue. And now the tech and political side is a lot more complicated, even over the last few days, between what we've seen with, uh, with Twitter and, and the notes that they made on, uh, on the president's uh, Twitter in the past couple of days, seeing what you, with Facebook about how they'll handle things. There's, there's a lot more questions about uh, about how that'll work in tech's much more on the defensive. Uh, when you look at tech's impact on sports, uh, it's being able to obviously different forms of distribution, uh, gambling, uh, statistics, um, you see the wearables, the amount of information that you can have is tremendous. And obviously the distribution of different sports is there. Uh, same thing in entertainment. Uh, obviously that's upended things significantly in terms of how people are used to things. Uh, and folks in sports, they have uh, we've seen today, just even with LeBron and, and others who have spoken up about different political issues, um, police, police misconduct, other things like that. Uh, Steph Curry and LeBron have their, uh, you know, entertainment uh, interests. Uh, and we've seen the fact that, you know, there's been an uh, increase in, in folks in entertainment and sports who also want to be able to invest in tech um, and, and have done so over time. In the middle of it, finance and brands, and law and media and storytelling is really seeing the impact that the people who have the money to be able to finance politics because of the changes in, in the campaign finance laws, they've been able to have a far greater impact. They do it through the content that they, the content that they create, through the technological opportunities to share it through social and digital platforms. Um, we've seen it, obviously the law has a factor and uh, brands are ones who have to be more and more creative as people have been able to DVR, as people have streaming services, um, there's different ways they have to reach audiences and the media and storytelling, obviously, hopefully the media is doing is more into journalism, but some of the media is more into storytelling. Uh, but either way, those are different aspects of uh, telling the stories of all the folks in this one. You can go to the next slide. Okay. So there's a lot of different ways to be able to, to get in touch with your audiences. Um, and you, there's, you have to think about all the different factors that are at play if you're an executive and that gives us into our next slide. Yeah, you can go on to, there we go, the circle. So um, basically, if you're looking at yourself as a, a CEO right in the middle there, um, you have to handle the corporate communication side of things. 
You have to be able to look at what crises might come up and how to manage them. You have to look at your internal communications and then the overall profile management. So there's a lot of details in, in these smaller pieces here that um, there's a lot of, um, Jay, we can take this wherever you want to go with it, but you really have to have your goals and priorities, understand your audiences and the messaging. That's sort of at the 12 o'clock on this slide. Um, you have the media relations, you have the company announcements and fact sheets and boilerplates. Um, and then you really look at where your potential, uh, you want to look at the positives of what you're trying to do first, which is that upper right corner. And then the lower right corner is, okay, but where does that leave you with potential vulnerabilities? Um, being able to make sure that you have response plans, being able to make sure you're being honest with yourself about the potential uh, exposures and sensitivities, um, and then being able to understand, and especially now and going forward, uh, the CSR initiatives with corporate social responsibility about how are companies getting involved in their communities and with issues we care about, um, being able to look at how you're communicating internally to your different um, your different audiences uh, and people that matter most to you. It could be investors, it could be uh, customers, it could be uh, it could be your own, obviously your own employees are very important, uh, media and others. Uh, and then that goes through your social and digital presence and, and that's sort of in the top or left-hand corner. So that's sort of, I guess, a quick background um, about how people have to look at the narrative, how people have to look at the dynamics that we're looking at uh, and understand how the world's working. And uh, I'll sort of leave it to you, Jay, about where you want to go from here. This overlap with respect to everybody essentially being in the storytelling business, right? You talked about sports, media, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, brands, tech. Um, but you personally have worked in a lot of these different areas. Can you talk a little bit about um, some of your background too? Um, I love this kind of way in which some of these principles apply. For example, you were just mentioning politics, you know, how some of the things you learn from political communications can apply to brands. Can you just talk a little bit more about your background, some of the things that you've seen? Sure, absolutely. Um, so my, my background, I'm actually a lawyer. Uh, I never practiced, but I'm continuing my legal education and my membership in the bar in New York. So I've done it for over 20, uh, over 20 years now. Uh, I'm really glad that I had the opportunity. I went to undergrad at Cornell to the School of Industrial and Labor Relations. And so it was a really, it was a smaller school within a bigger university. Uh, it was a great opportunity because uh, they really made an effort to have the student body be as diverse as the labor and the workforce. So we had folks with a lot of different backgrounds, really encouraged a lot of dialogue. So I'm somebody who's one of the rare people who actually talks still about courses I took in college um, and organizational behavior and uh, the different dynamics that were at play uh, during that time that really made an impact on me. Um, and then taking that to law school, Fordham was a great place. It was a great example of where you had a Jesuit university where it was people of faith, but were incredibly respectful to people of other faiths and backgrounds and dialogue and really doing a lot with community service was a huge value at, uh, at Fordham and encouraging us to, to participate in things like that. Uh, I went into politics. I was the press secretary for the Democratic Party in New York in the late 90s. Um, gave me great exposure immediately. My, my boss was a woman named Judith Hope, uh, who's an extraordinary lady, and she was the first woman to ever to be the head of a major political party in New York. And so working with her within two weeks, I immediately understood the challenges facing women in politics that are the same as women in business and some of the double standard. And you had, uh, in this case, there in New York State, there's over 60 counties, but there are 12 or 13 really more big, bigger ones population-wise and, and influence-wise. And um, the, all the county chairmen were men, and they tried to suggest she didn't know what she was doing, and she knew exactly what she was doing. And in 98 cycle, that's when Chuck Schumer won, and Elliot Spitzer uh, won as attorney general. Uh, and then all of my useless knowledge of New York State was useful when uh, Hillary uh, decided to explore running for the U.S. Senate uh, in 1999. And so I got to travel around the state and be able to participate in a listening tour for people to, for her to really get a sense of the people of the state, um, not just downstate in the big cities, but also a lot of the more uh, suburban and rural areas. So that was a great opportunity. And my background in law gave me the opportunity to really be very fact-based in my approach and the experience in politics helped with precision in terms of identifying audiences and how to be able to activate them. There was a lot of different ways then, obviously it was before social media was in place, but it was a great opportunity. And especially when we were looking at the, uh, the African-American vote in, like in Harlem or uh, looking at the Hispanic vote in certain areas of the city, that um, the folks who were running that part of the campaign, uh, there was one guy who was just probably not even 20 years old. And his whole idea was, well, if you can touch people five times, in some way. Now the five touch program there was different because then it was, uh, it was a flyer at the subway. It was a TV ad. It was one of those robocalls when people get in touch with you. It was an article in the newspaper. Uh, it was 
you know, maybe a conversation with a friend or, or, you know, mail or some other way. So obviously those things have changed, but the concept being that if you can engage with people, then you can uh, activate them to do things. Um, I went to, to work at Miramax Films and I got to deal with corporate communication. So I got to deal with Miramax Films and television and books and talk magazine. Uh, I got to work on the help produce the concert for New York after 9-11 and raise a ton of money. Got to deal with all different challenging films. And one of my jobs is to build coalitions around movies. So we learned there was a movie Rabbit Proof Fence about Aborigine girls in Australia who were taken away from their parents. That was the whole story. It was the film Ararat that uh, Adam McGoyan had done that was about the Armenian genocide that I hadn't done. And we had a, I learned very quickly how the Turks have very different feelings about that and the things we had to deal with. Uh, Madeline's sisters dealt with the Catholic church. Uh, we dealt with Fahrenheit 9-11, the Michael Moore movie in 2004. So there were other ones we built, um, you know, coalitions around winning, you know, Gangs of New York was about the history that we saw um, at the five points in the 1800s, late 1800s. It was sort of the root of a lot of New York politics. So I got to deal with just a lot of storytelling. I, I got to, uh, I was introduced to, through friends of mine to produce a film called Paper Clips. Uh, it's about a rural Tennessee middle school class in a uh, where totally white area, 30 miles outside of Chattanooga, within 100 miles of where the Scopes trial was and where the Klan was founded. And they wanted to educate their kids about other cultures and they decided uh, well, the best way to learn about tolerance is about intolerance. And so it's an amazing story of what they've done 20 plus years later. The school is still teaching. The kids are teaching others about the Holocaust and about intolerance, but doing it in a way that's uh, extremely respectful and, and very helpful to have kids teaching others. So I really learned the power of storytelling uh, during that time. Uh, and then I left and started the U.S. operations of a British firm. And then I've had my own for around 12 years. So we do a lot of corporate communications and a lot of those things that I outlined on the slide and strategic counsel for individuals and crisis management, litigation support and media relations. Um, and over the past few years, we've really seen uh, a real important um, addition to what we've been doing by being able to look at things from a consulting perspective, looking using data and analytics to be able to analyze people's profiles, understanding the sentiment about them, uh, comparing them to others in their, in their space, whether it be you know, actual comparisons or aspirational, uh, but just really seeing that there's ways to be able to then leverage that to be able to um, to really use content in a much more constructive way, targeting the audiences, and then helping in many cases to structure departments uh, to reflect some of the different ways that uh, people are trying to uh, be able to reach people and to understand where companies should and, and could use their resources most effectively. Yeah, Hopefully that's so a good enough overview. Oh, that's a great overview. And there's pl plenty for us to get into. First, let's talk about um, this evolution of di evolution to essentially digital experiences and the use of analytics. When you were first talking about doing listening tours with Senator Clinton, we didn't have all this data on people. I mean, it doesn't mean we didn't have any. It was collected differently. It was used differently. Can you talk about some of the things that have changed in terms of what becomes actionable um, now that we have access to digital information and digital insights? Yeah, I think one of the things is if you go back to um, I don't know how many people I might have seen either read the book or saw the movie Moneyball, um, that when you look at that, there was always the, you know, Billy Bean, it was sort of the, the balance between how much do you want to use data and how much do you want the eye test of what you're seeing. And so you'd have the old school scouts who would say, uh, in baseball, who would say, I can tell about whether that guy's going to be good. It could be things, uh, I want to see how that ball comes out of the pitcher's hands, or I want to see, you know, how quickly he, you know, he can turn his wrists and turn on a ball or how he can drive it. And then you're looking at the data and the analytics about actually, well, how did they perform? And, um, and I think that there's a little bit of that um, when you're looking at the way the political world works, because there was the idea that there might be sentiment about an individual, about somebody, that they have that like it factor. And because I'm just coming out of nowhere, which may not necessarily uh, show itself early on in terms of the numbers, but there's anecdotal side. So I think for us, it's, it's sort of that combination of being able to say, okay, what do the numbers say? What do the analytics say? What do people have to say? But also know, okay, you know, are there other factors? I think a big thing over time is that um, because of the influence that Twitter has on Instagram and other and Facebook and other platforms, is that people have the ability, people in the public uh, eye have the ability to be able to speak directly to their audiences much more effectively. And while the media remains, I think, critically important, and it's so important that we support journalists. Uh, and that we support good journalism, both on a local level and a national level, um, there isn't a way for people to be able to sort of bypass, um, to be able to bypass the media in some ways, to be able to speak directly to that audience. 
part of what uh, what what Senator Clinton was doing was to be able to was to be able to um, you know find a way to talk to people um, where they were hearing about them directly and being able to uh, and hearing them like actually say, well, what are my problems? What are my concerns? How am I um, you know how am I how am, like what do you want to hear about? What are the things that you want? And and so I think that concept is still really important because if you're just doing it based on the sentiments that you're hearing online, it's not going to necessarily help you um, to talk to people. And I think the other side is in that middle of my diamond that I showed you before, there is the psychological piece and there is emotion that's there. And um, we're all humans beings. And I think sometimes people forget that. And with the shield that's there of being able to, some people feel, um, you know, they can do anything if they're online. They have both the anonymity and they have the yes. ability to be away from people that all of a sudden they're superheroes of being able to say anything, even the most horrible things. Um, and it's, you know, it becomes a, uh, that's a different world also. And I think we have to make sure to consider all of the above when we're, um, you know, deciding how, whether it be a brand or whether it be a, a, someone running for office or just your own profile, you have to think about all those things together. Yeah, and so it's funny you bring that up. I think the, the a couple of things. First of all, I think it's fascinating to talk about this dynamic interplay between what we can know quantitatively from the data that's available versus kind of what we need to know to make the right decisions in the moment. If we're talking about a political campaign or a marketing campaign for a brand, some of the things that we really need to know is the why, not just the what. And in other cases, we're, we're thinking about the what if. That is to say, we know, um, how people are using the thing or how people feel about the person that already exists. What we don't know is how people would actually react if you had a different product or service, or if you had a different person in the job, like you know something that they haven't seen before or considered, right? And those are the kinds of things where your um, the insights you get from the transactions that occur digitally don't necessarily tell you that part of the story. At the same time, that quantitative data that you get from you know, your analytics activities, it's a, it, it creates a common language. And so it's a lot easier potentially to influence your clients with that quantitative stuff, as opposed to, you know, using other methodology, a listening tour or whatever to kind of get people to change their behavior. Can you talk a little bit about how you approach that, that influence part, how you take your stakeholders and convince them to do things that might be uncomfortable or, or not so intuitive, but are really necessary for success? I think part of it is really understanding what each person's priorities are and being able to listen to them and, and really hear them out uh, to be able to understand ways they've approached. I mean, one phrase that I can't stand listening to a lot is you know, for someone to say, well, that's the way we've always done it. Um, and so like, I, I want to know how you've done it, because that's helpful, but I, I don't necessarily. And so I think one, one big example about when that came up was uh, working with Katie Kirk for uh, you know, 15 years. It's, it's something where I, I've been blessed with working with a lot of high profile women and, and they were doing things others hadn't done. And my boss Judith, who I mentioned before, was the first woman to head a political party and Hillary was the first woman to be elected statewide in New York. And Katie was the first woman to be the sole anchor of the evening news on you know, weekdays. And, uh, Jane Friedman, who had been at HarperCollins, you know, did certain things that she was the first to do. And, and you know, over time, um, it, we've seen women who are, you know, really dynamic and even someone like Trudy Styler is married to Sting and, and what she was able to do with the Rainforest Foundation and, and other things. So I, I've seen this continually, but a lot of the time, if you're going to have someone who's the first of their, of their background or gender or, um, mm -hmm. uh, or sexual orientation or other things who are in a role or, or um, ethnicity or religion, uh, they're going to have to sort of, you know, go through, uh, have their own path about what's going to be a little bit different and what they're going to be facing. And sometimes it's a little bit easier. Like we, in, in New Jersey, where I grew up, you have the, you know, the attorney general's seat. And so like, it's not usual that people were used to seeing an attorney general who's, you know, wearing a turban, but Hey, that's just feels normal now mm -hmm. after, you know, doing that. And that's something that's, encouraging for people to be able to have it and in that role he was elected and so therefore you know that's something that was a little bit different when you look at things and with Katie's case she was coming in and CBS at the time was you know had only men who were there before in terms of the evening news they'd been in last place for 15 years before she got there and when she got there she wanted to change a whole bunch of different things and the, the question was 
can you adjust and adapt to that? And how is your audience going to respond? And are you going to give it a 30 day to 60 day sample size, or are you going to give it a six to nine month sample size? Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time is that people are very averse to change because as soon as they see those numbers in the short term, they're going to say, Oh no, we have a problem. And if you did that, if people only paid attention to that, then Seinfeld would have never gotten out of the first right. season. And you would have had other ones that were not like that. And I think that the other thing that happens in some of these cases is that you have people with political agendas, and I'm not judging whether they're good or bad, although some of them are not good, uh, I would definitely say, who are looking at a situation and they try to apply a certain label or principle to a situation. And then the conversation around that can sort of mess up the numbers um, so that the numbers may show something, but the story behind the numbers. So if you look at Peloton, there was that ad last year and people were like, Oh my God, look at the, the woman, the husband got her the Peloton. And you know, she was going to be on that. And what a bad message it is about body shaming and women and the whole thing. Well, meanwhile, Peloton's like laughing their way to the bank during like this time, right. because everybody actually, you know, so many people said, okay, I'm at home. Well, now I'm going to finally get that Peloton that, that I wanted to get. And so it really didn't have any impact you know, on their sales at all. And when you see certain controversies that happen to different businesses, it may be that someone's upset about it, but it's not the audience that matters. You see that a lot with, um, with voices in, um, whether it be in talk radio or, or television mm -hmm. or, uh, or others where you may have somebody who, who misspeaks about something and people who never watch them, listen to them at all are paying all of a sudden pay attention, but then they move on. But that person's core audience around them is not judging them based on that one moment. They're judging them based on like years of listening to them or watching them. And so they're not going to be as upset. Jimmy Fallon is not going to most likely have, you know, maybe he will. It's, it's a day later of going back, but I'm not sure that Jimmy Fallon is going to have the long-term ramifications because people really like Jimmy Fallon. And so, you know, someone could say, is there hypocrisy because Megyn Kelly had a similar situation where she talked about it and Jimmy Fallon had a case where he actually did a skit a certain way. And so what's the difference between the two? And, and so I think that that's where we're society wise, we have to just be really careful about how we make judgments about people and we have to how you make it about brands. And the more dialogue that there is between people or between a brand uh, and their audience, the more trust will build up for people to not rush to judgment about a mistake that's made even a high profile one. And, and people who are in the public eye, going back to the point from before, have that ability to directly communicate with their audiences in a way that then if they apologize, the reason why there's not many more of the, the big get interviews anymore, like on TV, it's just they rarely happen right. or they come and go and nobody really cares is because in most cases, the people who are well known, like have, their own have platform. a platform to do it. It's the people who aren't well known that all of a sudden are thrust into the spotlight who are the ones who have more of a challenge because the pace of our news cycle is such that they can be thrust into it. This is the perspective you have on them. And then the circus has moved on before they have a chance to necessarily change, you know, how you think of them. And then they're left in the wake of that. They, you know, a lot of them, people, their, their careers and their lives are, are ruined. So we've slid so nicely into this uh, topic, which is really the center of our conversation around how you deal with these really disruptive moments. Now, some of them are, self-inflicted but some of them like what we're going through right now are not right and so you know how do you think about how folks from a communications perspective respond to situations like this for example i'm thinking about brands right now where it would be wildly inappropriate for example to be promoting a luxury item right this second right, right. um versus kind of um where politicians might have a point of view right now about what's happened in Minnesota um, or any other kind of things that, that weren't of their creation. These are very different, you know, kind of um, points of view that folks may have. And then the third would be, you know, an individual who's gotten themselves in trouble by saying or doing the wrong thing. So you've got this whole thing going, out, going on right now with Amy Cooper. She herself has to think about what her um, response is gonna be. And to your earlier point, she doesn't have a platform. Right. So right. then how do you respond in those types of situations? Do you have principles? You, you talked about the advisory work that your company does. Do you guys think about these uh, kind of how to deal with a crisis in a systematic way? Or is it more of a, you know, uh, 
case by case or, you know, I mean, what are the ways that you think about those situations? Well, I think the most important thing is to be able to look at the medium to long term uh, priorities for a person and what's going to happen or for a brand and to not to understand that what you do in the short term will have an impact on their medium to long term but to make sure that you understand not to rush to do something. So philosophically, like I'm not a fan of just rushing to do a quick interview and to do things. Usually if you did something wrong, if you do an interview, you're not going to get the most out of it right away because most people are not going to care because either if you did something where it's seemingly really bad, then people are just going to only focus on the deed. <coughs> and because of the way people judge others, they're not going to be really one necessarily want to hear unless it's like a really legitimate explanation and context. And, um, but that that's unusual for that to happen. And so I think it usually takes a little while for people to sort of cool off in different situations and hear it. And so, you know, we've seen that, uh, in, in, uh, in a variety of, of circumstances and, um, look, some people for, um, especially businesses will try to rush to do something. And sometimes when you do that, you end up digging yourself a deeper hole. Um, because you end up having more to explain. And I think that there's, um, there are times that people are extremely principled. Um, there are times where people have totally done the right thing, but because others want to use something to advance their own agenda, um, they will try to make what you did into something worse than it actually is or into something it isn't just because of that. And I think that's where we have to be really, really careful when people are labeled um, as racist or, or in other terms that, uh, or where there's different forms of abuse, because if you're not, I mean, everyone should have the right always to speak up and should be encouraged to speak up about whatever their, their gripe or grievance is or whatever their opinion or, or perspective is. That's the beauty of our country is that you have the freedom to do that. And in the workplace, and especially people who are um, in less, you know, not positions of power, uh, not positions of power, we should always want to have people speak up. At the same, we want to provide an environment where they can, but at the same time, we want to provide the context to be able to say, okay, great. But if they speak up, like what's happening on the other side and is there an opportunity for someone to respond or are we just, you know, assuming the worst about them. And I think that's some of the stuff we've seen with this whole Tara Reid thing with Joe Biden, where it was something that, you know, the media was so, I won't, I won't overstate it. The media was interested in the idea about whether this, this was there and wanting to make, to, you know, to, to treat things equally. And when, you know, there was some really good reporting that happened later on of the vetting of her, where there was a lot of really serious questions about the consistency of her story and, and other background issues and other issues. Now, just because someone has a background where they didn't necessarily tell the truth about certain things, that doesn't mean at this moment they didn't, you know, about the particular incident, they didn't tell the truth. But, you know, in this case, a lot of those pieces did fall together. And so it was, you know, a question about, well, or is someone rushing to judgment of doing this before actually doing the, the reporting? And, and I think that's some of what was going on when, you know, Ben Smith wrote a piece in the Times last week about, about that subject and about whether it's the storyline is more important than the details. And, you know, how do you go about, um, you know, how do you go about, about these things? And, and I think that uh, as a society, we just have to be really careful to not rush to judgment. And sometimes if you respond a certain way uh, in the short term, it may not benefit you overall. And, and so we try to look at that context. We really, um, one of the most important things also is um, understanding the audiences that matter the most. In some cases, the audience could be one person. It could be somebody who's your boss who's going to make a decision about whether you keep your job. It could be a commissioner of a sports league who's going to determine about whether you're going to get suspended. It's going to be the CEO of Target who wants to see something in his local paper in Minneapolis about whether, you know, that might influence about whether he wants to have a product in the store or whether he wants to get rid of it. And it's really understanding, like a big thing in, in the film world is that, you know, a big thing would be that people would, there was a film we had called uh, Dirty Pretty Things when I was at Miramax. And it dealt with people who are undocumented in England. And it was a Stephen Freer's movie. And at that time, uh, Mayor Bloomberg was making determinations about how to handle issues with people who are undocumented in New York about whether they, uh, if they were in hospitals or um, if they had called the police for a situation about whether then they would be reported themselves. And these were very similar issues in the film. And so we were able to show the film to a couple of city council members, and we were able to encourage a dialogue that was based on the film. So it wasn't just if you, like you would see that movie, hey, let me look in the art section of the New York Times about a movie, but it was also getting it off the entertainment page 
and onto the news page so that someone saw it in another place. And I think that there's real opportunities for people to see things and people and ideas and brands in different environments than they normally would just usually see them. And that's the thing that also goes back to the diamond that I showed earlier is that, you know, you're going to see Steph Curry or somebody else, um, you know, in the entertainment side of, you know, this t-shirt challenge that you know, they're throwing stuff on James Corden and having a production company. And you're also going to see, uh, you know, you're also going to see in basketball and then you're going to have, you know, Aston Kutcher who does stuff in tech and you're going to see people in a different place. And if you see them in that different environment, you know what, you might think a little bit differently about them or the brand, um, you know, or even a candidate. And I think that that's something that's important is to be able to make sure you have an open dialogue with people of different, who have different perspectives so that when you're advising somebody on a crisis, you're not just, you know, uh, stuck with the group think of those who are like, oh, this is the worst thing. Like there was a couple of stories we dealt with that just came out in the last few days. None, none of the bigger ones, but you know, there's one where because you're around it, there's this big panic that sets in and it's like, oh, this is gonna be the worst story ever. And then it's like, well, yeah, the story came out, but it came out around this thing in Central Park and it came out around the Jimmy Fallon thing and it came out around another Trump thing and it came out around something else. And like, nobody even cared about this story. And, and so I think that's where that perspective is so important that yes, you want to know how it works. Yes, if it's a lesser known person, a story will have a bigger influence on the SEO like from before. But if you're a really well-known person or a really well-known brand, then you know what? Maybe come down a little bit and don't overreact. And I think that there's ways that people end up making it a bigger deal by doing it. Paula Dean was a great example where, you know, she had used, um, she used the M word a long time ago in some deposition and she gave like one of the worst interviews ever on today's show. Um, and it just made it way worse. Now at the end of the day, Paula Dean had a whole bunch of followers and, and supporters and an audience that the core didn't care because they're like, I know who this woman is over a long period of time and we're going to stay with her. And so, yes, we, most of the people didn't think it was appropriate. And so, you know, we're going to stay with her, but it may have hurt her chances to grow a little, but the core was still going to stay with her. And I think you need to understand like, like, well, was it necessary to rush into that interview or did you want to like actually show remorse? We had someone who, um, Mike Rice, who was the uh, Rutgers basketball coach um, a while back. He'd been at Robert Morris and then at Rutgers. And he had increased the GPA of the students. And um, a, one of his assistant coaches who was trying to undermine him took 21 seconds out of 120 hours of practice footage, put it together. And in it, he, he used um, the LGBT slur, the F word, and um, in there. It was not directed towards anybody who was gay, but it was in a word that was inappropriate to use. And... Uh, and I had him screaming and yelling and throwing a basketball at somebody. It was literally 21 seconds out of 120 hours. Well, it had been dealt with by the school, but then later on, it, it came out a few months later. And so you went through it again. And you know, no one really wanted to hear from him. So over the next several months, he spent time, uh, the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network, Listen, which is an incredible organization that, about education, the LGBTQ community. Um, they do great work. And so below the radar, like he went with them and they introduced him to high school kids who talked about how painful it was for them to go through it. And he went and saw John Lucas, the former, uh, you know, Rockets uh, player who had a lot of drug issues, who runs his own sort of rehab and whole facility for things down to Houston. And, and so he spent time there on like the anger piece of it and getting a chance to work with, with kids still. And so he took the two together and then spent time in Chicago speak, meeting with high school basketball coaches from around the country and told them about the importance of the power of their words and the things that they were saying. And so, and then he did the story with the New York Times Magazine. And then he did an interview with Robin Roberts then. But the point was he had done something. So he had something to talk about as right. opposed to just saying, oh, yes, I'm sorry about whatever. In some cases, the apology is necessary. But for the longer term, you want to show that you actually learned something and you did it and not in a way that it's just some cursory, hey, check the list. And yeah, I did that. Great. I did sensitivity training. But like try to do it in a meaningful way. Find a way to do that. And I think that over time, people like that are the ones who don't always necessarily get the same exact second chance, but it's a lot healthier for them um, and their well-being going forward to know, Hey, you know what? I did learn from this and hopefully others can actually learn from it too. Right. So last question before I open this up to others, 
Um, and just for those of you who are participating, if you scroll your mouse down to the bottom, you will see that there is a chat button. You can click on that and you can chat out questions if you like, because um, we're going to try to have the, the remaining time in our conversation really talking about what you guys want us to talk about. So please feel free to put your questions into the chat window and we'll make sure to um, you know, ask them as we go. My last question is you brought up something that I think is um, a real challenge right now. We have probably half a dozen legit crises going on right this second that demand a lot of attention. And so um, could you talk about just from a communications perspective, how do you even get people's attention right now? If you are trying to, to communicate about a political candidate, a brand or whatever, and, and trying to make a legit connection when at the same time, climate change, fires, pandemic, the president's tweets, um, you know, police brutality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like there are these kind of massive story arcs that are going on right now that didn't just start today, but in fact, you know, you have these moments in time where they seem to be metastasizing and taking up a lot of air. How do you even communicate in that environment? How do you communicate effectively and connect with your audience? Well, I think a lot of it is building the relationships that you can communicate um, over time more effectively. Um, and I think it's something of understanding that brands stand for different things. So um, when I worked at the Democratic Party, it was understanding that Democratic Party New York at that point had certain values and priorities and what it stood for. And each of the individual candidates or elected officials represented that brand in their own way. Collectively, that created the party brand. There's that confusion a little bit now because there's the people both on the far left and the far right who are louder, who don't necessarily represent what's there. When you look at the ways that the Democrats won back the House, it was having overwhelmingly moderate, uh, a lot of veterans um, in you know, other areas who believed in the values of the Democratic Party of the government having a role in taking care of people, um, but having perhaps a different view of how that should happen from the far left. And, and, and you have the far right has, and, and both sides make a lot of noise. And because they do that, when you have, and it's a whole separate conversation about journalism and how the media covers things, but, you know, people have found ways to get themselves in, you know, into this conversation. And so you need to, you, the challenge is to do it in a much more substantive way and a consistent one where you can go back and have those conversations with people. And I think that's where putting in the time to build the network, to build the communications that you're talking to people on an ongoing basis and not just like once a year. A lot of charities will reach out to uh, donors around their big once a year event. Mm -hmm. you know, that really isn't going to work that effectively because a lot of times those organizations are sort of going to be fading into the background because they're not taking the time to have, everybody's so used to the pace of it that it, you need to find a way to engage people more regularly. And so a lot of these places need to almost become, if you're an advocate for something, you almost need to become a syndicator of, of content of your own and for you to push it out to people to keep them interested. Now, the challenge is when you have bots get involved in the political stuff and you have people who corrupt the process, that's a challenge. But that's where, you know, I think people um, are going to, I mean, I'm right now, I'm speaking to you from upstate New York and, and just sort of being in town or going for a run around, it's a very small town we're, we're in for a few days, that the human contact of the number of people who are like ha so happy to wave at you, like are so happy to have human contact. And I think on the other end of this is that there's going to be that opportunity. It's not just about, you know, Trump rallies of having all these people together, but that is something that's important to people because they find an identification and that, even if I may personally disagree with the politics, we have to respect that that's a way that people express themselves. And, but other people have other forms of ways to do that. And if you can find a way to continuously discuss things with them and encourage them, then they're going to be more apt to more consistently advocate for your cause. And that's how you'll, well, you may not be the, uh, eventually it will come around to your cause, but you can consistently, if you're like number two, three, or four on their list, you can get a lot done, even if you're not necessarily the top news story. Um, and I think it's building that consistency and the continuity. So, so just a quick follow-up, the, strate the strategic piece of that, you know, if you're 
I mean, let's, let's talk about a nonprofit that has their annual banquet, their fundraising banquet or whatever, um, or some other strategy that's been wildly disrupted right now because they can't have people meeting in person or they've had to cut their budget or whatever, right? Um, you know, building out, you said, you know, become a syndicator of content. Well, that takes resources. Um, yeah, it does, but do not as much as it used to, because you can just, you know, pick up your phone and just, there's other ways to be able to do it. It's help having people tell their stories. It's understanding who the beneficiaries are. It's understanding how the impact is made. Um, and it's being able to touch upon things and to sort of amplify examples of where, you know, hey, this is the real life example of what we're trying to teach. Uh, the glisten example earlier was when Jason Collins, the basketball player, was you know the Love first Jason. player who came out, and and uh, I mean I'm a, I happen to be a Nets fan, but the but it was something where like that was a time for people to discuss it, but that didn't mean Glisten's work ended then or Glad or some of these other different groups. They're doing things all the time, and there may be times where it comes up in the news, but they're building a grassroots of being able to have conversations and being there for people who are in need or people dealing with some of the, the challenges that they face. And if you build that support system over time, those people, you know, have that through the social networks, um, have the ability to expand that and, and to create, you know, greater interest and consistent engagement also to, you know, yeah. be supported financially. But, but you know, I, I love that. And I, I want to kind of drill down on this piece about the, you know, like there are less resource intensive ways to get your message out. The, um, you know, Jason Collins is a great example. There's a guy uh, played in the NBA, very successful, a collegiate superstar, right? Um, yeah, he and his brother. He, yeah. Yep. He's he's um, a smart guy and a really good human being. Um, and there was a time when that was a story, right? So people, oh well, this Collins guy, he came out and you know, etc. Um, is he going to get to play? Is he going to get picked up by a team? But here we are now, years removed. And for people who want to talk about diversity and inclusion in sports, and particularly this issue around gender and sexuality and sexual orientation, um, you know, Jared Collins' story, Jason Collins' story, um, the, the kind of impact of, you know, I've actually heard Jason talk about it when he had to talk to his brother um, about it because he didn't know, right? He was keeping it to himself. Um, you know, the, all that stuff that came out and bubbled to the surface at the time, which ought to be evergreen, it proves that like right now it's not, like it's not a thing that people are talking about. And so if we talk about, well, how do we inject some of those ideas? Yeah, but you can still have that dialogue. Like you looked at, um, I think it was a guy who was like a punter on the Vikings or a couple other people who talked about these issues and were outspoken about this. I think it was, it was a, a punter, I have to remember, I think it was on the Vikings or maybe the, the Ravens and like, spoke about the, and he wasn't gay himself, but it was speaking about these issues. And you had certain hockey players who stood up and you had things where, then you had this media obsession where, you know, I remember there was a, a reporter for a New York tabloid, not the Post, um, who, um, who went up to, you know, a player uh, who was then on the Jets, who's now on a different team, who's incredibly successful, um, and said to him, well, you know, you're a religious guy, he's a um, black guy from the South, from a very religious family. And said, well, would you be okay having a gay teammate? That was like the question for there. And, you know, he talk, talked about how he, you know, that homosexuality is a sin, but you know what? There's all these other things that are sins too, and we're all sinners. And so I would embrace him and love him just the way I'd love my family because we're all imperfect and we all do different things. And I'm not judging anybody based on that. And it was a way, it was an imperfect answer by some people's accounts. But, you know, the person then tried, the reporter tried to get him to say, well, what are other sins? And was ready to do like, oh, he said murder. He said this was other sins. Right, and tried right, right. to say, oh, he was comparing him to a murderer. But he was doing no such thing. He was actually showing love and saying, like, none of us follow exactly the, you know, mm -hmm. what the Bible or the teachings of whatever anyone's personal thing was. And yet, you know, we we got ourselves involved and made sure that the reporter didn't write it. But if not, that guy would have been tagged as having, you know, made that comparison when he absolutely did not make that comparison. And so I think that's where there's a, there's a responsibility of the media to also be a little more careful because. That, that may be the Jason Collins story isn't there, but he's still there. So until, and there hasn't been another, you know, you don't see a lot of other players right. coming out. And there are other gay players in the NBA. Of course there, there are. are. Statistically speaking, every, there are many of sport. them. Yeah, and there just are. Now it's their prerogative of whether they want to talk about it. But I think that's also goes to the broader idea about when 
can people feel comfortable talking about these things more? And I think that more dialogue creates more respect. And that's where the, this divide about, you know, the left and the right and people on the far left, and like they have every right to express their political views, but they also need to be able to encourage, you know, dialogue with others. So we have evangelical clients and people on the right, and I love my conversations with them because we find that we actually agree on a lot more things than maybe people would assume. And, and I think that's a really important piece of our political dialogue that my hope is next year and beyond, people will have the healing process to be able to look at that. Hopefully we'll have a new president and have a, you know, a different healing process and the opportunity to do that. So I want to come back to this, this challenge of, of um, you know, the media and, you know, we're all a part of it, but um, specifically this, you know, which we see much more clearly when you're talking about social media, but it's also true of our news media nationally. Um, trying to have influence over platforms you don't actually control, right? And, and, and what does that look like when you're trying to help people tell stories that make a real connection with their audience and are authentic when it has to be filtered through a channel that they don't control? Like, how do you, how do you manage that? Well, that's why the media is in trouble mm. because people are going to go around them more and more. So that's part of the problem. And, and there are certain members of the media who, like even if you just look at like morning shows, it used to be that like there was being the Katie Kirk or being you know, the Matt Lauer, being the Diane mm -hmm. Sawyer or Barbara Walters, or um, you know, right now there's, there's still being, you know, wanting to be Gail King. Or wanting, there's still yeah. uh, George Stephanopoulos. There's a couple of people that are still there, but in general, like that's sort of gone away. And so when you have reporters, like Maggie Haberman, who I know forever, um, who you know, writes the New York Times, she's an amazing reporter. She's a great reporter. She gets the substance, and you know, the the president knows her from back then. You know, her New York Post days before, as she made her way over, you know, to the Times, and so she she's a great reporter. And there's other ones who cover the beat, who just are very substantive. They stick with the facts, and they're presenting it. But then, unfortunately, you have others who are just who make the biggest deal out of every little thing. And every little thing is not the biggest deal. And so you sort of get people to tune out when you start to see the agendas there. Like there's a couple of publications that decide they are going to view the prism. Uh, They're going to view anything from the evangelicals or big supporters of Trump through this prism of all oh, the big supporters of Trump. So therefore, it's almost like there's there's a strike against them. And we have to like assume what they're saying is not legit. You saw that um, with Liberty University with like you know, oh, the Times wrote multiple stories. Oh, look at what's happening. They're keeping students on campus during the time. Well, I'm pretty sure UCLA had foreign students that were still around too. And most schools had students who couldn't leave. So they weren't going to class and everything was virtual. But it was like, because this was someone who was a school that was associated with Trump, let's look at it. And they wrote two, three stories and no one ended up having it. And the Wall Street Journal did an editorial about that last week also. It's like, were you like rooting for there to be a problem? And so there's some cases where you have the White House or others claim, oh, you're rooting for a problem on something where it's totally inappropriate and wrong. But then you have examples where clearly a journalist was rooting for a death. And those are the ones that are dangerous because um, they end up getting attention that legitimize an argument that someone may have, which then taints otherwise potentially excellent reporting by their colleagues or by others at their publication. And I think that's where we need to be a little more careful about not you know, going with the predetermined storyline. And that goes you know, back to your earlier point about marketing and how do you change a brand and how do you do things? And you know, how do you get away from, well, that's the way I've always done it. Well, some of it is doing the counterintuitive storyline and, and saying, hey, you know what, let me give this other point of view. Now, some cases it might be an isolated one. The Israeli-Palestinian issue is another one, you know, where people sort of, if, if you're far to the left, you have this idea about this underdog situation that is not necessarily accurate. And it's not understanding, hey, did you ever go to this huge factory area on the West Bank where you have 70% Palestinians and 30% Jews and they all work together and, and the, the Palestinians working there have wages that are five times than what they would be in other places. And it produces an enormous amount of products and people go after Scarlett Johansson for supporting SodaStream that's there. Well, did you actually understand that by them moving it, the factory from there to another area, you now made sure that a whole bunch of Palestinians lost their jobs. And so you're supposedly an advocate for them, but you actually, your advocacy and protesting something actually resulted in hurting them. 
And so that to me is the point of where people need to be much more informed, whether it's people who have the, may have the best of intentions in their in things they're doing, or whether it's reporters or whether it's, you know, caring about all sorts of topics. Hey, you know what, maybe slow down a little bit, maybe have a conversation with someone who, don't, who you don't agree with, because that sort of engagement could be very valuable. And I think with brands having the opportunity also to say, hey, you know what, why do people have a problem with our brand? Let's figure out, like Domino's had a great one where they said, they basically were like, our stuff is terrible. <laughs> we're gonna like, your comment, your complaints about us. I think it was Domino's, it was Domino's or Pizza. I'm not the best consumer I think it that, probably but, was Domino's. But, but they basically were like, the CEO was like, look, we're terrible, let's, let's, let's figure it out. And he embraced that. Mm -hmm. And then people responded because Americans are totally fine with people admitting they have flaws and Americans are totally fine with people apologizing. And, and if you do that and you're doing it in a you know, meaningful way, then you know what, that's another way to have legitimacy as, as a brand because the imperfections can actually, you know, lead to people really relating to you a little better too. But I don't know if we're going to have questions from others. I, I can, you and I can talk probably all day and I'd love to continue, you know, talking to you offline also, but, but I'm, I'm happy to follow your lead. So I'm working questions from others into our conversation, um, oh, okay, which, brings me to, which brings me to another, which is, so, you know, we've got, obviously, again, we're at the business school. We talk about the business of media, the business of entertainment and so forth. This issue around communications is key because essentially every company is, a story, is in the storytelling business. And there's this very interesting symbiotic dynamic that goes from kind of brands and brand messaging to entertainment and particularly what we used to call television and how it's monetized, right? Um, in terms of the way we reach fans. And I'm wondering in that context, because you've had so many different roles and you've been in entertainment, you've been in, in politics, you've been in these different communication roles and now have, have kind of stewarded a whole team of people that are in this space. You know, how has the, um, specifically the communications business evolved? How do you make an impact out there right now? Like, how do you use resources to do that? You know, a long time ago, we could talk about what the lobbying business was like, and that's kind of very similar to what it is like, because you're still trying to get access and trying to educate uh, public officials about certain issues. When we talk about uh, the communications companies and their roles, I would say the same thing about music labels. That has radically changed, <laughs> right? The business has changed because the media of communications have changed. And so could you just talk a little bit about that in the time we have left in terms of what do sure. you see now? What does that mean for folks in that role? Well, I think um, I alluded to it a little bit at the, at the top when I, I referenced some of the other ways that we, um, the resources and the, the tools that we use. Um, when I, my, when my oldest daughter was in first grade, uh, I went in to try to explain to the class, like, what do I do? So I came after like the dentist and before somebody else who had like a really easy to explain job. And it's not easy to explain our job to like, to adults, let alone to first graders. And, right. and my point that I made was the same way that, you know, Dora the Explorer has a map and the stages that she needs to get to be able to get to, it's always three things she has to get through to get to the end and handy many had his tools so that he would be able to use and and um and so what i did was i had the uh i had a, a bunch of a big box of colorful paper clips and i referenced before the movie that that i produced with that name and um and so i had the kids make um paper clip bracelets out of it and i said well here you're going to help me tell my story if you, you're going to have these paper clips bracelets when you go home you're going to tell your i didn't explain that it was a holocaust movie i just explained it was a movie but that the kids, when they went home, I said, when your parents ask, well, what happened? You know, what's with the paperclip bracelet? You'll explain to them that oh, Ella's father was there and uh, came in and he, he told us this was, you know, what he had a movie with this name. And so, you know what? You're helping me do my job. You're, you're sharing something with me. And I think that you have to look at a particular audience in a time and say, great, what is the, sometimes it's as simple as a paperclip bracelet that someone's going to look mm -hmm. at. But other times you have to, to be thinking much more creatively. You have to be understanding the audiences that actually care. You have to understand and, and use the resources about being that precision that I referenced earlier about how to reach them. And you have to understand that the other stuff that's not your target audience is a lot of noise. And so even if you may you know, take some heat from somebody about how you're doing it, do those people actually matter to you or not? And, and so I think that's the evolution of it is really being able to, to put on the, you know, the, you know, the, the earmuffs to be able to say, okay, I don't, I'm not, now you need to be open to hearing feedback and other things, but if it's going to be that you're just getting attacked, you may know you have to get through this storm and you have to get through those three challenges like Dora to get to that finish line. 
And I think it's being able to have the experience and the perspective to say to somebody, all right, look, I'm helping you. I'm your map. I got my tools and let's use different tools for different things that you need. And let's work together on helping you get to the other side of it. Now, along those lines, you're sitting there advising somebody. We just talked about how in many cases, a crisis emerges and you want folks to wait a beat before they respond or do the work before they respond. Um, in some situations, the public is going to form a judgment and calcify that judgment before you can come back. Like you may not be able to take a beat. How do you balance the need sometimes for a quick response with the need for, for a smart response? Well, I think sometimes depends. Obviously, the obvious answer is it depends on the circumstances. Um, when there's a legal issue at play, um, the legal circumstance really speaks very loudly because. Uh, there's a lot of times if you say something, you can make it a lot worse. I was just dealing with someone over the weekend uh, who was in a situation where uh, the legal situation is going to work out. The person's employers, it's, it's, it's in the media sports area, that the person's employers are backing them. And, and so if that audience of 10, 15 people is, are backing you, then even though it may calcify as someone remembering, hey, whatever, that's there. Another factor is whether the person has perfectly clean hands. So if it's somebody who has gotten in trouble before, and now this is just like another time they've gotten in trouble, well, it doesn't really carry as much weight because people are almost like, oh, well, that's them just going off and doing their thing again. Um, you know, and I think that's another this area. This is the problem I would have, have if I had a crisis. <laughs> <laughs> but you can have it as people who are both because when you look at someone like Alec Baldwin, who's a friend of mine from when I worked in politics and I worked with him for several years, we don't work together now, but, but he was somebody who is, is a, just a very, very kind heart and does so much charity and cares about a lot of things. But people also knew that, okay, he had a fight with a photographer and then he had another one here and, and there were words with friends on the plane. And then he had all these different, and some of them were ridiculous and some of them weren't, you know, weren't totally ridiculous, but it was that people understood who he was. And so if it was something else, it wasn't going to have the same impact as it was, you know, if you had a, a, you know, with Tom Brady, all of a sudden you had, you know, the flake gate. Now right. as a Jet fan versus a Patriots fan, you may have different opinions on what that was, but you know, it's a different light, but in no way is that taking away from the fact that Tom Brady, he was one of the greatest quarterbacks ever. Um, but it's, it's just sort of dealing with it. In that case, the audience was really the commissioner and the process and you get into the, whole, you know, sports and legal side and, you know, some of the inconsistencies, the application of rules and what processes are in place. And, and it's, it's a confusing issue. So what's happening now when you see a man murdered by police or allegedly, whatever the determination, he was killed by the police for sure, uh, whether it's murder or not is determined. But like, you know, that's a, that's a thing that's much easier and much clear cut. And that's something that if you, you know, and, and that's the most serious end of the spectrum. And then you have other things. Well, what if someone used inappropriate words? What if someone had the blackface? What if, you know, someone was smoking and they shouldn't have been? And it's like you have to decide that based on your overall experience with the person uh, and the values. And that's why I think the best way to prepare for uh, a crisis is to be able to, you know, build up the goodwill and demonstrate who you really are so that this way, if it happens, people will be much more forgiving because they'll have a much bigger sample size than just the, the small one that might not reflect positively on you. And so um, I think we're, we're about out of time, but I want to ask the last question, which is related to this, which is, you know, we talked about analytics and data before. Um, and obviously we have tons of access to information you do about your clients, about the situations we see that come out into the public. When the data tells you one thing, but the, the media narrative runs counter to that, how do you deal with that situation, right? So you're sitting here on information that should create a narrative that, for example, puts the person in a positive light. The media, on the other hand, is, is kind of turned this into a story. You gave it an earlier example about um, the university down south, right, and how they dealt with COVID. Um, how do you address that? Right. You know, there's this momentum heading in one direction. You have a, what you think is a story that should be heading in the other direction and is not sticking. Well, I think, look, some people dig in and, and they got to the other side of it. And so the Wall Street Journal wrote about it. And then even the New York Times acknowledged it in one of their columns afterwards. And so by digging and digging, digging, and not giving up, it got there. We had that happen with Sean Parker, uh, who we worked with. And when he got married in Big Sur, he had actually put in, he, he had a, a very lavish wedding, but he had put in 
millions of dollars to restore the forest there and, and a campsite that had been in somewhat disrepair. And he put it into a place so that so many other people were going to be able to benefit from that area. And so, you know, there was initially good coverage. And then uh, there was someone who wrote and there were people from the Coastal Commission who they didn't even almost care to look about what Sean actually did. They just didn't like the idea of oh, a wedding happening in the woods or whatever. And they didn't even pay attention to all that he did. And Sean would not give up. And he wrote multiple pieces. And an observer who's watching you from the outside would be like, wow, this guy is digging himself a deeper and deeper hole. But he believed in it. It was, a, it was a principal issue for him. It wasn't just that he had put the money into it. It was that he had done something that actually was good for the environment, that right. was right, that was helping people enjoy, that was doing all these good things. And eventually, he actually like sort of dug out on the other side. And he, and he found his way there. And, and most people don't have the, um, the thick skin or the determination or the time um, to, or the resources and don't dedicate the time or the energy and the creativity and everything, the emotion to get through to there. And I think that in a communication standpoint, from a communication standpoint, the communications are not only the external, it's the internal. It's, it's an executive who makes a mistake and how are they telling their company about how they deal with it? It's the, it's the person about how they tell their family. It's the person about how they tell their viewers uh, about something. And the reality is that almost anything a celebrity does, no matter how good it could be, it could be the most beloved thing, you know, people are going to find a problem. And, when you're talking about the numbers and the data and the analytics with it, um, you know, there are certain celebrities or, you know, people in the media or, or in culture who actually, when you look at the number of people magazines that they sell when they're on the cover are extraordinary and they're not necessarily who you think. Um, I'm not a big fan at all of the, uh, the numbers of impressions, you know, that some people do. It's like, Oh, we did an event with Tina Brown with women of the world. And there were like a few years ago and it was like 7 billion impressions. And it's like, that means nothing. And any advertiser who, or a sponsor who just is interested in just impressions, to me, that is, that's like empty calories. Now, there may be some value to it in some small way, but like those numbers don't mean anything. And I think that's where it may be that the number that matters is the ratings. It may be that the number that matters is how many widgets that you sold. It may be um, how many votes that you get. But other times you're there basically for the audience of one of the individual and helping them psychologically to get through it and to let them know that they have a future and to let them know that they can weather the storm. Um, and in some cases it's easier, some cases it's longer, and in some cases they'll get back to where they were and in other cases they never will. And I think that's where people have to be more responsible about not judging people um, you know, until they actually fully see the results and, and uh, can you know, have a more complete conclusion. Because if you start, the, the point about the quotes from before is that if you give a quote now and the circumstances change, then you're giving another quote. And then you're giving another quote and you're much better off if you have given one where you're honest with yourself about, well, what are the other things likely to happen in the sequencing of things? And so let's say something that will also hold for that, you know, for these next three or four things that may happen or for the three or four things that may not happen that people assume will. And so how do you, um, you know, how do you make sure to communicate that properly? Love it. Love it. All right. We have to leave it there, Matthew, but thank you for an amazing conversation. Um, as you said earlier, we could be talking about this for the whole day. Well, I got, I yeah, think. I have to get on the phone and keep talking. So I, 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 sure. I love the stuff you do. I, um, I'm glad you, you know, I know you're more of a West Coast guy, but I know you had your time in New York at Columbia, at least, so we can, uh, you know, with, but, uh, you know, I love being able to have these conversations. I'm very uh, grateful for you to have invited me and and to have a chance to do this, so. Absolutely, you know, I'm bi-coastal, so I spent 30 years of my life in New York City. Uh, okay, that's Queens right, boy, okay, I forgot about that, right. Queens that's boy, right. but um, have, I'm happily here in Southern California now, very happily. I remember that you came over here, I forgot that you had the Queens side, but I'm sorry, mm -hmm. so I'm glad that we, uh, you know, we got that in common of the, the New York City sensibility, you're bringing it out there, that's good, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm trying, I'm, I'm carrying the banner. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, it's got a Mets logo on it, so people don't listen, but that's why I have you. So, <laughs> Thank you. Um, have a wonderful day. Thanks to all the folks that participated. Um, if you have further questions about the topic, feel free to reach out to us. This is not the last time we're going to be talking about communications in this context. So please stay engaged, stay involved. And Matthew, thank you again. Thanks very much for having me.